She's been called the queen of bean. 35 years ago, if we wanted to buy a cup of coffee, we probably went to a diner, spent 25 cents, and hoped for the best with quality. Our guests had the audacious idea to serve only premium coffee at premium prices in specialized coffee shops. Joanne Shaw, CEO of The Coffee Beanery, is this week's leader on leadership. Knowing when to ask for help is critical when you're in a leadership position. It's getting the best out of people. That's the essence of leadership. Major funding for Leaders on Leadership is provided by Greenleaf Trust. Helping people manage their wealth, accumulate assets, and preserve those assets for generational continuity implies trust. We are sitting down on the same side of the desk as you are. We're planning for your financial needs. Additional funding provided by the Wayne State University School of Business Administration. Welcome to Leaders on Leadership, here with the student audience on campus of the Wayne State University and Detroit Public Television Midtown Detroit studio. I'm Larry Phobes. Joanne Shaw's life changed in a couple important ways around the time she graduated from high school. Thanks for being here, Joanne. Well, it's glad to be here. It's an honor. You, you've talked a couple of times about your high school graduation ceremony, and one of the speakers made this kind of chilling forecast that only five or six of the students out of the hundreds graduating would be successful. How did you react to that? Well, we were all standing in the auditorium at the time, and they said, look around it. And, um, five of you will be successful and one will be very successful and I just knew in my heart somehow I wanted to be one of the five I didn't have a clue how or why or where or how I that would happen but I it just was ingrained in me from that time on as, as a personal goal personal objective yeah it's a personal objective now the other thing that happened right around graduation time is you, you married a uh, week after high school, <laughs> I married my husband, and we will be celebrating our 50th wedding anniversary this year. So even though my mother said it never worked, it worked. <laughs> it worked. <laughs> you started working full-time with him in the restaurant that his uh, family owned. While you were working that, did you start formulating this plan? How are you going to be successful, or were you just kind of waiting for opportunity to knock? Uh, I think I waited for opportunity to knock for a long time. We weren't really formulating anything. I was learning a lot about the restaurant business and um, family business and working really, really hard at the time, plus having children. Now, while you were in the restaurant business, you and your husband got into the coffee business, in, in a, not for consumer goods, but another way. How'd that happen? Well, uh, we had a gentleman that was selling us coffee that had started a coffee service in Saginaw and he tried to get my husband to start one in the Flint area and so he showed him how to do it and ultimately we, we started putting coffee brewing equipment in offices and businesses and then delivering on a monthly basis to those businesses. We still have that business right now and it has about 2,000 accounts and it's still located in Flint and um, we just we have the best coffee that any business or office could ever want. I wonder where you get your coffee from. Uh, well, <laughs> mostly from coffee beanery. Oh, I'm guessing that. So in 1968, that restaurant closed. Uh, your husband took a job in an insurance company to, to pay the bills, but you kept the coffee service business going. Yes, we did. Um, and he was working in the insurance company full time. Uh, plus delivering coffee and building that business a little bit at a time and then he got offered a promotion and where he would manage six people so he turned to me because I wasn't in the restaurant anymore and he said um, I'd like you to take over the coffee business which meant that the children were in school pretty much full time so I climbed in the car loaded it up with coffee and started delivering coffee and we had 60 customers at the time 
and uh, a few years later we had a couple hundred. Now, eight, um, fast forward about eight years, and you had this idea for a whole new coffee kind of business, one that really didn't exist, and this time it did deal with consumers. What was the idea and, and what was it, the rationale behind it? When I was selling coffee or trying to sell coffee service to offices, I'd often hear, you know, I never drink coffee or I don't like the taste of coffee, and, um, but I like the smell. So I just felt that if we created this place where people could come and experience really wonderful tasting coffee, because back then it was the Pepsi generation, freeze-dried and instant coffee, and you couldn't find a good cup of coffee anywhere. So I just had this strong feeling that if we created this place where people could come and experience good coffee, that they would come and they would love it and they'd become coffee drinkers. And so, so that was just the thinking behind it is to make it a comfortable place where people wanted to go, not institutional coffee. Exactly. Okay. Now, in those days, right now, there's, there's this huge industry for coffee. What, was there anybody else thinking about doing this when you started, or were you in front of the curve? Uh, we were a little bit in front of the curve. There were a few people in New York that had some stores. There were some out on the West Coast that uh, had been doing that for about five years, but they didn't have big, ch nobody had big chains. There was just small. Regional. Small, regional, yeah, groups of stores. So you had this idea that you're really pretty passionate about, you thought would work. You then found a location at the new Fairlane Mall in Dearborn, uh, yes. an A-class mall, when it was opening up. And then you had to do what all entrepreneurs do, is go out and look for funding. What did, invest what did investors and bankers think when you brought this really unproven idea to them? Well, when we brought it to them on a napkin, they didn't like it too well. <laughs> but um, the first few banks, we weren't very sophisticated in the way that we presented our, our business plan at all. As we learned and got rejected, it got to be a little bit more formal and more formal. And um, the seventh bank finally said yes. But they said yes in, in, in a way that said, we're going to do an SBA loan. You have to take the existing coffee service and a non-existing store that's in your mind and build a business plan and combine those two together and give it to us. And you're going to do it our way. And actually, it took me, back then, we didn't have computers. We didn't have everything that we have today. We had spreadsheets with 13 columns on it. And I did it all by hand with pencil and paper and eraser and calculator. And it took me a couple weeks, but it's probably the best exercise I ever went through. I, I learned what I had to do to make that business successful. Looking back at the whole financing exercise, what's the most important for entrepreneurs seeking funding? Is it the, the brilliance of the concept, the quality detail of the business plan, or just being thick skinned and lots of persistence? Persistence, yeah. persistence, and and actually improving it as you go. You, you just should never be satisfied. You should always be improving your business or your or your your concept and working on advancing. And because business is fluid and it changes all the time, so you've got to be on top of it and you've got to be moving ahead with the marketplace. You, you talked a minute ago about having to put most everything that you had up for collateral on the financing to start the business, home, cars, your other business. We hear that from entrepreneurs a lot that are on the show, entrepreneurial leaders, that they were willing to bet the farm on a really unproven idea. Why, why are entrepreneurs willing to do that? Do they see something in the idea that the rest of us don't see? Are they just fearless? Are they reckless? I don't think we're reckless. I think what we do is bet on our ability to make something happen. And it's, it's because you can see it and, and you believe in it and you, you just kind of know that, it, that it, it'll work. Now, it doesn't always work the way you think it's going to work. And more often than not, you, you have bumps in the road. You, ha you run into barricades along the way. Um, I told a friend once, I, guess I keep running into this brick wall, and she said, well, why don't you get a ladder and climb over? And I thought, hey, that works, <laughs> so you just keep going. 
So you got the money and the store opened in, in Dearborn in 1976. Mm -hmm. So tell us about working that first year in the store. I'm guessing it wasn't just hire staff and watch the money roll in. Oh no, no. Actually the very first day my husband added up the, the receipts for the day and he said if this is all the business we're going to do we are in deep trouble. <laughs> and um, I said okay what you know we still have the coffee service and we'd hired a family member to run that. You have your insurance business. I don't need to make a paycheck. We'll just take whatever we get and put it back into the business. And in fact, I didn't get a paycheck for probably 10 years. For a while I got rented, but <laughs> I rent instead of pay. But um, it, we just kept putting money back into the business because that's what it took. But then it took off. After a couple of years, revenues, you got a second store, revenues were up something around a half a million dollars, I read. Mm -hmm. yeah. A couple of years later, a third store, and now you're approaching a million. Then you decided to take the business much larger and you chose the franchising model. What is franchising? How does that work so we understand the, the system? Franchising is teaching somebody else how to do what you do exactly the way that you do it and so that they can uh, benefit from that experience and hopefully taking all of your mistakes and not repeat those mistakes. Franchising actually is, um, a lot of people think of McDonald's when they think of franchises because it's just duplicating everything. It's like having rabbits having babies. There's lots of them out there and they can grow and grow and grow. So if you get a franchisee that opens a store and he does well, then he might open another one and another one. So franchising is a great method for expanding a brand across the country. You once made the comment that a, that a good franchiser, mm -hmm. a good franchisee, someone who buys it, is someone who's entrepreneurial enough to want to control their own destiny, but not so entrepreneurial that they won't follow the rules. How do you, that's, that's a delicate balance. How do you recruit uh, franchisers that can straddle that line? Well, franchisees that straddle that line are usually people that um, want to be in business for themselves but not by themselves. Actually veterans and, and people that have served in the, in, uh, the armed forces uh, are, really make great franchisees because they are used to following a system. But if you come into as a franchisee into a system and you want to change everything, then it no longer is what it was to begin with and customers start to get confused about what, what the brand is. So what, what can you do as CEO of the, of the parent company to help them keep the brand intact, help them be successful, but not get in their way? Listen, communicate, make changes where they're necessary. Um, you can't just shut people off. You have to really involve them in, in any changes that happen in the company, um, set the standards. Um, make them realize by communication how important it is to maintain the concept and, and to that the customer, I'll use an example, we went, I was in an airplane that landed in Utah. We don't have any stores in Utah. A pilot said that he had our coupon. He asked what I was doing there and I said, I'm coffee beanery. He said, oh, I, I, I love your coffee here, I'll show you, I've got a coupon for your coffee in, in Utah. And I said, well, we don't have a store here, where do you buy your coffee? And he said, well, I buy it in Miami, but I live in, in New Jersey. So if it's not the same everywhere, that pilot would not love our coffee. And I use that story to explain to our franchisees when they're coming into the system, how important consistency is. Thanks for being here, Joanne. We're going to take a quick break, but when we return, we'll talk more with Joanne Shaw, CEO of The Coffee Beanery.
Welcome back to Leaders on Leadership. Joining us today is Joanne Shaw, and we're talking about her leadership of the coffee beanery through three decades of explosive growth and change in the industry. The, the industry is now mature and established, and there seems to be a, uh, a coffee shop every place. Tell us about the coffee beanery. What makes your company unique? What services do you deliver? How do you deliver it? Well, our coffee makes us unique. And we have created a process called the right roast for our coffee. And when coffee's picked, it's picked over, it, it's a crop, and it's picked over at least 90 days. So you'll have early crop, mid crop, late crop, and the moisture content in that coffee is different in each one of those pickings. So we have got to adjust the moisture content and the time of roast to, to bring out the best nuances in our coffee. And if you over roast a coffee, you lose all of those nuances. If you under roast it, it just doesn't develop. So our coffee is the most important thing that we can keep consistent and keep really high quality. Now, when you started uh, the coffee beanery in 76, as you said, you were just the, the national industry was just getting started for specialty coffee shops. What's the state of the industry today? How large is it? Some understanding of how big it's become. Oh, it's immense. Uh, and it's growing even more so worldwide right now, internationally. But um, the, the amount of coffee shops, I think uh, Starbucks has, what, eight or 9,000? And um, uh, there are an immense, we just were at the specialty coffee show, and 6,000 people attended that. And the majority of these people have stores. So there's a lot of local stores as well. Um, but to have consistency is, is important. And, and the reason that a franchise is, is a good way to grow is so that you have the, the support. When we for, opened our first store, um, we couldn't afford logoed cups. We couldn't afford excellent signage and marketing materials or any of those things. And today, we have all of those tools, plus a lot of the internet tools to market. There's been a, so there's obviously been a huge change over the life of your company in the industry, in mm -hmm. the environment in which, you, in which you do business. How do leaders of any organization keep their business fluid enough so they can make changes with the times and keep current? Well, you have to, for one thing, stay in touch with what's going on in the industry what's available, what's new. Um, you have to be very creative and innovative, and that's actually one of our values. And always um, try to stay fluid and make changes as, as you can. And I think that those are important things for a leader to do. As, as, as the company's grown from basically almost a one-person business to, to, to a national, international business, how have, what have you done to try and help people not rely on you as the only leader in the company, but for other people in the company to take an active lead in their piece of the business and not just rely on Joanne to save the day? Well, the fact that I'm an entrepreneur and not necessarily the good manager, I really had to try to make that change. Um, what I do now is just try to show where it could be as I is because I can always see forward I've always been able to see forward and 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 I've always wanted continuous improvement so try to just lead in those directions and then rely on really great people to execute the the operations of them and creating and making that happen basically now, is that transitions happening from it being a sole lead of you to other people taking on roles how do people in the company what do they need to do to demonstrate their capability as potential leaders and so they get more responsibility and can advance their careers they need to do more than they're asked they need to make the boss look good they seriously do they need to um, be involved in the business and never say, oh, that's not my job. Um, and, and just be on the forefront and come with ideas and solutions. If you have a problem, come with a solution. There's a lot they can do. 
you, you talked about the size of the industry before and, and the size of some of the, some of the competitors. You, you mentioned one company that has something like 10,000 stores out there. You have somewhere between 100 and 200 stores, order magnitude. How do you lead your company, to the, the, the David, to take on the Goliath and win in, in markets? You have great products and great people. And, and the nice thing about franchisees is they're local. They get involved with the local communities. That local involvement is something that a big giant company can never really have. Um, we have a store right down the street at, um, in Berkeley and Dan Cleary is a wonderful um, representative for being involved in his local community. You've obviously been a passionate leader for the company throughout, throughout the, uh, the 35 years, I guess now. A couple of years ago, you sold part of the equity uh, in the company to, to Laser Investments. How difficult is it to, make, to let go of part of the, the company that you've worked so hard to build? Actually, that never happened. It didn't. No, the deal never got done. But um, I didn't Google far enough. <laughs> no, you didn't. You didn't. Okay. That we we looked at doing that, and they were a very strong franchisee out of Cyprus. Yeah. Um, but for some reason, it, the, it just didn't happen. But we have involved in our company our two sons, that are um, have been with the company forever, and they are very involved, and they have ownership. And that, that's a transition as well. Well, you've also had a partnership since the very beginning with your husband. You said he runs the, the service business and, you, and you've been in before. As, as I read about you, you're the visionary, as you just stated, mm -hmm. and he's the, the pragmatist. Mm -hmm. How do you make tough business decisions where you may not agree at the workplace and then go home and be friendly over dinner? <laughs> We've never had a problem with that. Huh? Never. Uh-uh. And even with our children in a family business, uh, for some reason, we just shut it off when we're home and it, it works. He's a great guy, too. That helps. That helps. <laughs> now, you, you've been very successful in this business, obviously. You didn't go to college. Mm -hmm. Any advice for people who think there's too many hardships in their life or too many roadblocks in the way that are keeping them from being potentially successful as they start their career? Well, I would say, first of all, if you're in college, enjoy every day and be grateful that you're there because it's a, it's a privilege to, to be in college and be able to have an education because it would have helped me. I, as I look back, it would have helped me a lot. Um, but I, I think that young people just can just do whatever, just dream big and then go for it, okay. honestly. Okay. Got one last question for you, Joanne. In your professional life, um, you've been involved, you've helped change the way America thinks about coffee. Mm -hmm. In your personal life, part of your exercise routine over the years has been weightlifting. Yeah. Let's put those together in a hypothetical situation. Assume the U.S. Olympic Committee calls, they want you to lead a task force to increase the popularity of weightlifting as a personal sport, as a spectator sport, and as an attractor for funding and, and sponsors. How are you going to take that on? Oh, well, I would, <laughs> it depends on what, what they want me to do. If they want me to become a spokesperson, I would do that and, and show that weightlifting can keep you young and our coffee can, can, <laughs> can energize you and keep you going so you can weightlift. There's a lot of benefits to coffee and we also have a great fundraiser program that earns money for organizations. How would you change America's understanding of what weightlifting is? Well, I'm five foot two and weigh about 120 pounds. I mean, I could certainly do that in a heartbeat. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thanks for being here, Joanne. Thank you. Please join us again next time for another edition of Leaders on Leadership. See you then.
Major funding for Leaders on Leadership is provided by Greenleaf Trust. Helping people manage their wealth, accumulate assets, and preserve those assets for generational continuity implies trust. We are sitting down on the same side of the desk as you are. We're planning for your financial needs. Additional funding provided by the Wayne State University School of Business Administration. An encore presentation of Leaders on Leadership is available online for viewing at dptv.org.